Hey there, everybody. Today is Thursday, August 18th. We, uh, we've pulled a few of the pumpkins from uh, the vine. Uh, they do do better ripening off the vine, so I'm going to share what signs we were looking for when we pull them to finish ripening, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the spaces that we're turning over in the garden and the spaces that we're not turning over in the garden, and share some of the reasoning behind those decisions. So I hope that sounds interesting, and let's get started. We're looking at several of the pumpkins that I've pulled so far. There are a few more that are below this size here, which is generally what I'm looking for. Um, the two that you see that are lighter in color were the deepest set in that bush, but this bit of orange here, I hope you can see well. We look for mostly that shade, but when they get way too big, I'll pull them early. You can see that we've also been started to be visited by some of the squash bugs that we have in the area. Um, so it's a good time to start pulling fruit so that we don't miss out on anything good and we give the plant an opportunity to um, conserve energy and nutrient for the development of later fruits as it goes through the season. I've only been growing this for two seasons thus far, but it seems to do well into the fall. Um, and it's, it's probably the best pumpkin I've ever tasted, if I'm being real with you. So, we look for super dark, about two hands tall, um, girthy, and I'm going to show you guys some notes from the garden. So, let's turn around. So, this squash and this squash, both pumpkins, both the same species of pumpkin, long pie. Both seeds are from the same parent plant. And the big difference is that this one, we harvested seeds, about half of them from the pumpkin. And we dried them and stored them over the winter and then started them in pots and then transplanted that. This one was uh, smeared with a bit of the fruit and then buried for the season in the fall. And recently, I was watching a video interview podcast recording from uh, John Kempf, who is one of the founders, if not the founder, of Advancing Eco Agriculture. They study agronomy, and while some of the things that they uh, theorize is a little out there for me without better documentation and maybe some peer-reviewed uh, confirmatory research. Some other things are very compelling, and about two years ago they had an interview with a research agronomist from Rutgers University down in New Jersey, where I used to live. And his research, uh, his research is about the interplay between soil bacteria and plant health. And his findings and his team's findings were that um, plants that are given the right starting biology are more apt to consume subsoil bacteria, including disease-causing microbes, such as milky spore, powdery mildew, and the like. They, plants consume those microscopic organisms, oxidate them with oxygen pulled from the environment, and break down their cell walls so that the plant can use them for further nutrient uptake. And his suggestion is that the plants cycle these bacterium through their cells and then inject them as a portion of the root exudates and then pulls them back in once they have rebuilt their cell walls and consumed more of the minerals that the plant is looking for. So that's interesting. They've documented it and observed it over several different types of plants, 
and it feels compelling enough to say that I think they're probably onto something. I think that ties in a lot to land race plants and cultivation and the generations of plants that self-seed doing better long-term through field studies than seeds harvested, site-grown, and then transplanted. So I'm going to show you guys a few more things, and we're going to talk about those implications as well. We pulled fewer potatoes than I would have liked out of these beds here this year, um, but we had some serious damage being done by uh, two different species of potato beetles. But we had some volunteer tomatoes that popped up, and so I've transplanted those in. I could have done uh, another run of the twine and jute that we used for the A-frame, but that performance has been rather lackluster, and it actually snapped under the weight of two of the tomato vines already. So I think that the welded wire is going to be an avenue for not only a sturdier construction on the A-frame next season, um, but may become our trellising material of choice. These were all planted within a week, and when we turned over the soil from the potatoes, I mixed in some of the char that we had been using along with some of the duckling bedding that we had gathered and started to uh, consolidate. And so these are so far, uh, on average, about six inches to 10 inches taller than they were when they were planted. And you can see just how much biochar we have still, even on the top. I would suggest that between the powdered forms, the wood ash, the manures from the ducklings, I would say that the soil amendments are equating to around 30 to 40 percent of the parent material that these are growing in at this point. The biochar was mostly in the base, and then we backfilled with some of the potting mix that we had from the grow bags. And then the parent native dirt on top of that, which is what the tomatoes were planted into so that they would seep down uh, looking for more nutrient. And so far, that seems to be promising. Over on this side of that walkway and trellis, you can see one of the pokeweeds that I'm leaving for the birds. There's another one just behind it. And when I come up with what I'm thinking of planting in the rest of this space for overwintering, um, this will get a little bit more cleaned up. But these lettuces are now second year. They have, up until the past couple of weeks, been producing greens for us. And then when they started sending up flowers, I stopped harvesting. But what we'll do is allow these all to go to seed, and then we'll gather them up. And you can see on the far side of this mullen, they have started to go to seed and topple over, which is their main spreading mechanism. There are some other plants in between that we've planted, and these seeds will get dispersed into several of the other gardens to be uh, an understory to some of the perennials, and we'll also be sending some of it to the ducks as part of our forage mix for them. And so these beds here get several volunteers throughout the season as we move compost in and out, but this gets harvested and sent to the ducks, and I don't view it as a wasted space because I'm getting seed and I'm getting forage for the ducks and the ducklings, and I'm watching how this space evolves from one lettuce plant maybe two, two or three years ago to mostly lettuce and greens taking over and I'm enjoying watching the evolution of it. So I'm going to continue doing that. Let's take a look up on the other side of the A-frame. The shepherd's purse has definitely filled in a lot of the blank spaces and the Queen Anne's lace is coming in strong. 
but under here we do have kales and collards and some uh, tomatoes toppling over in the back. While it looks like these have tension, it's mostly because of the weight of the tomatoes pulling them over, and you can see the significant lean that these have taken on as the tension has broken the ropes. So I think our next approach is going to be to square this up, possibly add a third piece to form tripods on each end, and then run cattle panel or welded wire fencing up and down this, and it may become more of a permanent installation. The kales are doing wonderfully, although they are beginning to be eaten. I think they're stressed from the heat and the lack of water, but they'll, they'll bounce back precipitously, and I do expect to get seed off of them hopefully a little later this season. So we'll see how that goes. I realize that towards the second half of August, in New England, it might be a little foolhardy to be uh, hoping for more tomato packing uh, fruit onto fresh vines, um, but it was what we had on hand and I had originally hoped and planned for a longer growing season for the potatoes. So um, would I recommend it as a rule for folks? No, probably not. I think. Um, better planning and maybe just having even more seeds on hand um, for just random random seedings or the ability to cycle through uh, a wider variety of plants in the gardens but you know we try to plant the things that we use the most of and that we can store efficiently so uh, pumpkins and the winter squashes and fall squashes are coming in as they've been planted out, and uh, we did get, you know, some potatoes, and we're selecting out what we're going to store for seed for next year and continue this, um, but I might, I'm honestly considering doing a fall planting, even though um, it's not really the advised way to go about it. We had volunteers popping up this year, uh, and that seemed pretty awesome. It was nice to get surprise potatoes and the ones that we pulled that had come from uh, last year's gardens had deeper color and a deeper flavor. So it seems like something worth pursuing. I'm interested to hear what you folks have to say or if you have some uh, land race vegetable raising experience that you'd like to share with us as we dive a little deeper into this topic. But that's... That's pretty much our update for right now. Um, we have a gentleman here getting ready to work on the chimney for our baseboard heat. And so I'm taking this opportunity earlier in the morning to do some videoing, talk to you folks, and uh, we're going to let him start making noise. So hope you're well. Till next time. Thanks for watching. Happy planting. <laughs>